Okay, thanks everyone for joining in. So, without further ado, we'll uh, kickstart the session. We've uh, appropriately called it Writer's Might. Uh, we thought we have with us a very diverse panel that sort of straddles, uh, you know, an entire spectrum here. So, uh, you know, right from uh, Arun sir, who's had a long and a very sort of prolific uh, corporate career, corporate leadership, and has, of course, gone on to be involved uh, within social impact uh, with various facets, whether it's with the Avishkar group or is work with some of the other nonprofits. Uh, we have uh, so Mr. Sanjay Roy, who, of course, in one of the is the man behind the Jaipur Lit Fest. And of course, uh, you know, on the other hand, is also actively involved uh, with the Salam Balak Trust and many other such organizations. And finally, we also have uh, Mr. Samya Roy, who uh, has sort of, I would say, translated all her work with, you know, uh, with the voice speaker community in Mumbai and the book that she's launched recently. And I love the positioning right now in the uh, frame itself. So right behind her, uh, Mountain Tales. And of course, we'd encourage everyone who is listening into this uh, conversation to please go ahead and, uh, you know, get yourself a copy. And uh, finally, we have our moderator, Devanshi, uh, part of the IDR team, who's itself had a long association with Sankalp. And uh, yeah, Devanshi, over to you to take this conversation ahead. Thank you so much. Perfect, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for being here with me. Um, and of course, to everyone who's tuned in, uh, I know in India, at least it's 7.30 PM. Uh, it's been after a year and a half of primarily Zoom meetings, uh, I think. The digital fatigue can be a lot, so we really appreciate your time coming in to listen to what I hope is going to be a really exciting conversation. Um, as mentioned already, the panel has really varied backgrounds, but in spite of that, I think one thing that everybody has in common is a belief in the power of narratives and the belief in the power of stories. So given this, I think we're going to start with just asking one question to each, like to all the panelists, which is, um, could each of you talk about how stories, uh, either those you have written, in the case of Mr. Myra and Soumya, uh, or those that you have read, um, have, have they, how have they changed the way you view the world and your place in it? Um, if you have anything specific that you could that you would like to draw upon for this, uh, that works too. Um, Sanjoy, could we start with you? Uh, thanks, Devanshi. And uh, you know, you're talking about narratives and stories. Well, we're at the heart of Ashtami today which is an age-old story about um, good over evil. What we forget is that it's really about conquering your ego. And ego is at the heart of, of what we know as evil. And in the telling of stories, what comes together is we discover places, we discover people, philosophies, histories, uh, the way people are. And especially in places like India, which lives in so many centuries and at the same time, which lives in different realities, which lives in different economic uh, spheres. The one thing that binds us together is stories. From birth, from cradle to grave, whether you're rich or poor, you're bound together by the commonality of themes, whether it's our big religious and social religious uh, celebrations like uh, what's going on right now, the Ramlilas and Durga Pujas, uh, or the more universal themes that we look at, which is the teachings from the Mahabharat, the teachings from our great epic, and most importantly, even the teachings on environment. If you look at the Jataka tales, which hail back so many thousands of years, the commonality of theme there continues. And every tale that you read from the Jataka tales today still holds dear and holds real. And the other thing about stories is that a story can be seen from so many different angles. Each of us will receive the same story somewhat differently. Each of us will interpret our story somewhat differently. And that really is what makes humanity um, such an incredible place. And in no way does at any point of time can you say that this story has only this one truth. There are many different truths that we live in, many different realities that we embrace, and that really is the magic 
of, uh, of stories across the world, irrespective of where you are, America through to New Zealand and every bit in between. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Anjoy. Um, Samia, uh, over to you. Could you tell us about how stories uh, have changed the way you view the world and, and your place within it, or have informed, if not changed? <laughs> I would say that at first I was a reader for growing up, I've always been a reader. And the thing about reading stories is that they give you this very finely edged imagination. Um, you believe, and, and it also stretches your imagination. And somewhere when you're always immersed in stories, you believe that something very different is possible. When you emerge from that place, that world that you were immersed in, you believe that even in real life, something, a different world, that, that world that you were immersed in is possible. That person who you don't see in real life could, is a person. They're not just a character. They're not just somebody who lives far away, somebody who lives in a different world, but they are a real person. And you, you learn to feel for people who are not like yourself. And I think that is the greatest magic of storytelling, the ability to feel for people who are not like yourself. So I would say that for me, that is the magic of life stories, most of all. Um, as a writer, I would say that it's something that I struggled with more. And many writers struggle with this because people will tell them, oh, so what changed? Nothing changed. You know, you wrote something, so what happened? And as you know, that I followed um, these race papers that I wrote about for about eight years. And I remember when I finished and I went to give them finished copies, I did, you know, like it was as if this particular project was over, but I did go with a sense of um, concern that you know what had really changed materially for these, these people in my book so I remember give, giving a copy to this um, girl in my book Halkira and I had uh, followed her since the time she was I think 13 or 14 and now she has two young children and I felt that you know and she's a very fury character and she, I thought she would say well what has changed for me nothing has changed and you know you have a book out and what has changed for me and what she actually did say was that it, she held it and she was so happy and she said, um, that just in that act of writing, something shifts, something changes, and she just felt so happy. So that, that somebody will know how we lived. Somebody will know how unreal our lives were, but that they were real. Thanks, Somi. I think you brought up two like important points, especially today, you know, just the ability to learn from different people's lived experiences that are unlike your own. And also whose voices do we platform, you know, um, who do we give space to? But uh, we'll come back, we'll circle back to that a little bit later in the conversation. Uh, Mr. Meyer, same question to you as well. Thank you, um, uh, Devanshi. I've been thinking uh, which stories have influenced me uh, the most in my life. And I said the fairy tales that I was told when I was young and all of us, I think those fairy tales, they had some, some ideas in them, some lessons in them, and they have continued to, uh, uh, in some subconscious way, influence my, my thinking. And then as I grew up, um, I was uh, um, given my, my mother uh, the Bhagavad Gita to read. I was just about able to make sense of difficult English. Um, so I went into that and the story of the battle of Kurukshetra, the Bhagavad Gita, and in that story, this dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna um, really took me. And in the second chapter of that uh, story is uh, 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 this saying that uh, you only have a right to the work and not to the fruit thereof. And I must say, even to this day, I, I struggle to understand what is the work that I must do uh, now that I have been born and, and not wishing even to have the, the fruits of the work, which includes feeling of success and satisfaction that the work was well done. So I struggle with the, uh, understanding myself and why I do what I do. The second uh, book, which shortly thereafter or alongside it I was reading was uh, my mother's behest again, uh, Gandhiji's autobiography, The Story of My Experiments with Truth. And that I continue to go back to. It's a story, it's a story, 
It's a story about a person discovering what the Gita said you must discover, that you have a reason to be on the world for the sake of making the world better, and you should not be uh, hankering for well, the fruits of it. And again, I say, what do you mean by the fruits of it? Surely the outcome of it is a fruit that I should be uh, wishing to have. Um, and then I went on and I began to read stories which were told in a much shorter way and simpler way in poems and the poems of Robert Frost have really turned me on. And uh, in the same vein uh, of uh, what's your purpose and what do you do and why do you do it? Uh, in one of his poems, he has these lines, if you'd allow me to, to say them, he says, but yield who will to that temptation. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation as my two eyes make one insight. For only where love and need are one and work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heavens and the future's sakes. So these are some of the stories and written in different forms um, that have continued to um, engage me. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, um, I remember studying that poem in school actually, and it was really nice to hear you uh, to hear you recite it. Um, Ms. Mari, the books that you've written, so you told us a little bit about the stories that have inspired you, that have helped you uh, understand or think deeper about your place in the world. Uh, but for the books that you've written, they varied in thematic areas that they've covered. So how do you, what factors guide you while you're deciding what to write about? And then once you write, how does the process of writing change the way you engage with, uh, with what you're, with your subject? Um, you know, I, I'm always, uh, uh, this is maybe a, a punishment, uh, uh, but always concerned about what is going on around me. And um, at different stages, it's different things that's happening around oneself uh, that uh, one gets engaged with, concerned about. And so whatever is concerning me deeply at a certain stage of my life uh, is what I begin to inquire into. And, and I wonder why it is so. Uh, and sometimes with that come, you know, the need to explore how it could be changed. So that begins to influence my learning, my reading, and with that, also my writing. Because for me, uh, writing is a way of understanding my own mind. It's something like in the vein of the great Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, writing is autobiography to like his notebook actually, and every evening uh, to listen to himself. So my books emerge at that time is really a discussion with myself on, um, about something that I care about and my beginning to understand why it is so. And then some thoughts about uh, how it might be different. Um, and for me, therefore, writing is a process of learning. Uh, the first book, the first book that I wrote was in uh, 1996, when I was uh, consulting to uh, multinational business companies and, and large business companies in the US and uh, in the Western world. And this book, title was The Accelerating Organization, Embracing the Human Face of Change. And it was um, my uh, reflections with the companies that I was working with and reading about companies and um, that why is it that some companies continue to do better than other companies and uh, what makes such great companies tick? And for me, it was that human heart, uh, resonating together of various people at various levels in the organization that made organizations uh, great. Uh, so therefore it was, you know, the embracing the human face of change. My second book, um, or it was my second or third book, but it was a book I wrote when I came back to India. It was uh, Remaking India, One Country, One Destiny. And when I came back to India after those 11 years, uh, having gone just before the liberalization, and coming back in 2000, um, I found uh, there wasn't one India. Um, uh, we were making some India, but it was uh, an India for only some people. So it was about one country, one destiny. And it was a collection of uh, articles that I had been writing for seven, eight years, short 800 words um, editorials on what was on my mind. And it was all about India, it turned out, even though I was writing from abroad. 
And so this was put together into a book. Um, so once again, you know, it was something that I had been reading about, listening, and wishing to clarify my own mind. So that was in 19, uh, 2004, actually. Um, and in that, uh, I began to, um, you know, point out that India wasn't shining, really. I mean, Bharat certainly wasn't shining, but even India wasn't shining, though the economists kept saying the GDP is growing, now India is shining, and the corporations were being attracted to a shining India. Uh, whereas that time too, in 2000 and 2004, there wasn't enough drinking water for people, though they had cell phones now. There weren't enough jobs and incomes, though the stock market was booming. Uh, so what sort of country were we uh, becoming? So that was then. Then I joined the planning commission and in between I wrote a couple of books. Um, I joined the planning commission and my experience there of uh, why is it that in spite of having you know, very well-intentioned senior economists and including our prime minister at the time, um, uh, why is it that we are not able to reform the way our country's working, the policies are working or the policies what they are. And so uh, it was also actually at the behest of the prime minister that I inquired into why India is not able to redesign itself. And I wrote a book then called Redesigning the Aeroplane While Flying because you're in the institutions, you're in your country, and while you're in it, you have to change it. And it's difficult because it's risky to change something that you don't really understand because you can cause more harm. So the book was Redesigning the Aeroplane While Flying, Reforming Institutions. Um, and so it's any engagement with the topic that uh, really is um, concerning me, and I become very curious about understanding more about it that leads to my then you know writing my thoughts down it becomes a book. So I've written a book on democracy, the discordant Democrats in 2007, then transforming capitalism in 2008. And, and the subject of listening through all of this, that are we really listening to poor people, uh, people who have different educations uh, in economics and sociology and, and so on, even listening to each other, the complete dearth of listening, I feel, in, in society. So then I wrote this book uh, about uh, listening, listening for well-being, conversations with people not like us, how it's difficult to have a conversation with someone who you feel is not like you, but why it's become so necessary in the world to learn to have these conversations. And graciously, His Holiness the Dalai Lama wrote uh, the, the introduction to uh, to my book. So I'm just saying that this is how I begin to write. And during the pandemic, we were here locked in for 18 months, plenty of time to listen, actually. So on these Zoom meetings which made possible, people from all over the world, I listened in a week during the lockdown time to more people than ever listened in three months when I was able to fly around to, to go meet people. And then they're listening to different points of view and different conversations and reading a lot. There was a lot of time and also then to keep writing down what I was learning. So I wrote five books during the pandemic, which have all been published, uh, including one on poetry, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, five books during the pandemic is a feat that I, I don't even know. Uh, how to react well to, apart from to say congratulations. Uh, but on your point of listening, it actually segues into Sanjoy, something I wanted to ask you. Um, you have worked consistently to increase access to literature and to increase access to the narratives that we're able to come across and find. So, you know, be it through the Jaipur Lit Fest, but it, be it through uh, Salam Balak Trust, be it through your policy work with the government. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you think we need to increase access to stories, whose stories are told, um, and, and what impact you think that could have? So story, taking from what Arun said, uh, Devanshi, stories is about knowledge, finally. It's about inherited knowledge. It's about knowledge that you glean as you're writing a story or telling a story or exploring a story. And knowledge, as we know, is really the fountainhead of any development in any part of the world. I was in a session earlier today about space. And one of the things that was so surprising is that to the 50s, man never looked at traveling to space. But as stories started being written, 2001 Space Odyssey and so much more, there was this thing of let's go to space. Of course, today space has become the sort of 
celebrity quotient with the Elon Musk of the world uh, wanting to get out there, but how do you then balance it with the fact that the need of the moment is to correct the biosphere that we inhabit mm -hmm. rather than necessarily looking at this space outside? Whereas the narrative that's being spun is this is the next big uh, step for mankind, uh, pretty much taking from uh, uh, the first person who traveled from space, you know, a, a giant step. I mean, a, my first step is a giant step for mankind. So narratives can change the very perception that you're based in. And this narrative that we've been sold, which is a sexy space travel, uh, which can be done affordably for people uh, who afford a particular kind of thing, not, not people like us who inhabit the art space. But what we forget in the narrative, is like what Somi has written about, et cetera, how do you ensure that the narrative deals with the situation at hand? And that's where stories become very important. And I'll again give you an example. Arun Myra in, um, in, I think it was in the late 80s or early 90s or whenever, did a, put together a group of, for CII, put together a group of people from very disparate backgrounds, people like me, um, a, a, a predomination of industry. There was lots of government, many NGO sector people, and our street kids from Salam Balak Trust. And from that entire exercise that lasted for a year, he gleaned a little narrative of four slides, of four uh, graphic slides, which told you the story. 25 or 30 years after that first narrative, those four slides or those four graphic uh, telling of a particular story still holds true. The story has that power to bring about change. And I'll end with a little, a, 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 a little incident that happened one year in Jaipur, sort of four or five years into the inception of the Jaipur Literature Festival. We put in security because we were getting really full and it was a weekend and I received people for an hour every morning, uh, gates open at 7.30, was standing uh, at the top of the steps. And this man and a boy walked through uh, the gates of Diggy Palace. And because they looked like they didn't belong, they were stopped by the security. And so I went up and I said, Bhaiya, you know, or can I help you? And he said, you know, I sleep on the, on the pavement um, opposite SMS hospital up the street from here. And um, I know that I will never be able to afford to buy my son a book, nor ever to send him to school. But I thought if he heard a story, it would change his life forever. And I heard that you tell stories in this place and I'm so sorry that I've come. For somebody like that to have walked through the Haveli gates and crossed the threshold of caste and class in an environment like we have in India today is, is a huge thing about change. And uh, the, the, the next uh, storytelling that I'll tell you, this was in Dantewada, where we were doing a storytelling festival, where we worked with the local government to bring about peace between the Naxals of the region, the government forces. And we brought together schools from a hundred kilometer radius. Many of these children had never seen a teacher because of the ongoing violence. They came to Dantewara in buses that we collected them and they were ceasefire. And we having prepared had put together stories from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, et cetera. And when these stories were being told to these kids, we realized that there isn't really that universal story. They had no idea about the Ramayana or the Mahabharata characters, but what was universal was their stories on the stars and the streams and the trees and the birds and the fish and the fowl and the land of the earth and what the earth provided, the animistic traditions that we all understand and realize. And therein again, the power of a story lies in a belief system that all of us intrinsically can believe and in believing can bring about change. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Somya, you work on the intersections. You, you're an activist. You're also a journalist. How have you seen stories play out in your work? Um, where do you think journalism and activism intersect with each other? Um, 
where where do those stories differ? Where do they come together? Um, how do you see that happen? I think where they come together is in that they are able, they are very gently able to make you see these very dark knots in society, places that we don't want to see. Um, they'll bring light, they bring sensitivity, um, and with the degree of you know just being gently but prod you and take you to these places that you have not been before that you don't want to go um and just by bringing sensitivity and bringing light it's a step that was not taken before and and often that that also leads to something i don't i don't deny that at all but i think just um bringing that light bringing that sensitivity is something that both um um, is where they where they meet. And when you were asking me that, how do they differ? I would say that where they differ is that sometimes there's a little, just as I was hearing Mr. Mayra, I was thinking that the space where they differ is that maybe there's a little more space for dialogue in writing. And maybe there can be just a little more space for dialogue, even in activism, as you call it. Um, so I, you know, you, you raise such such interesting books that that I obviously like who would not engage with the books that you first spoke about. And I was thinking one of my uh, favorite books on this account is the correspondence between Tagore and Gandhi, and the book is called the Mahatma and the Poet. And so the name Mahatma for Gandhi was given by Tagore, um, the great soul. And so the, through the book, there's, it, it's, the, it's, it's the, a compilation of their letters that they exchanged over many decades. And um, so it's pervaded with the love that these two greatest figures of Indian history had for each other. Tremendous love, tremendous affection. And yet in those letters, they differ on every issue. Uh, on every issue of fact, they differ. Whether it is Tagore opposes Gandhi for fasting. He does travel and go there and request him, please don't fast. But he does say that I don't think this is an effective form. If you think this is self purification, please don't do it in public, then do it in private. So they disagree on, on their views on women. They disagree on their, um, they disagree. Uh, Tagore disagrees with him on, on his views on caste. He disagrees with his view on science and rationality. And yet, when you come away, when you close the book you just feel that tremendous love and affection that they have for each other and so i think that space for dialogue is just so wonderful in writing in in in, in say letters or um in 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 journalism and writing and maybe this is this is a space that we can also incorporate in activism as you call it this you may have your view and you stick to it throughout Gandhi and Tagore have stuck to their views over the 20 30 years of this dialogue and yet i feel that um, there, there is that space to have that dialogue and sometimes to have that space outside the page is also so important and so wonderful and that is where they differ and maybe the space where they can meet. I think Sanjay is wanting to add something on this dialogue also. Sandra, would you like to before I ask a follow-up? I, I, I added it, I added it to the chat where I said the oh. goal most importantly took issue with Gandhi on his notion of nationalism. And he said it would come back to haunt us as we are seeing today has, on his notion yes. of nationalism so many decades later, but go ahead. Yeah, I um, I wanted to build somewhere on what you just said and ask, you know, given, given where we are in the country today, uh, given everything that we have going on, um, do, if you say we need space for dialogue um, and we need space for people to listen to each other, like Mr. Myra said earlier, what do you think people can do to be more intentional about the kinds of stories they consume? Um, why is consuming different kinds of or being or listening to different kinds of stories important? And and what is your what's your view on that? Sorry, question is too. Yeah, I think it's very. Um... As you said, you have to be intentional in listening to stories, just reading stories that are different from the ones that you, uh, just listening to different stories, diversity in what you read, diversity in what you hear, make that attempt to listen to people, however painful it is. Um, like, you know, it's funny nowadays, I often get asked that, oh, you've written about so much poverty and, you know, foreigners are going to read it. This is, you know, almost not nice. Um, and I feel that more than, more than people abroad, it's important for people in, India also to see, um, like my book, I feel it's not about race, but it's also about how um, 
people live and in in and to take us to that place which is actually not very far from where we live say in bombay where, where people i think where people who read the book live and people who are in the book live um and that distance is not much but it's it's so far in our minds that we don't traverse that distance and we are um a little bit embarrassed and ashamed to traverse that distance and that and such places exist in invisibility such the invisibility that we create in our mind um and and just shedding that light just just trip, taking away that invisibility and making us see this place that is not far from us but but that we don't want to see um i think just just going to those places is something that that books do that stories do that and we have to be intentional in reading those stories and it also puts a responsibility i feel on writers to make these stories engaging um to not be didactic about them to not feel that the reader must read them but to make them so engaging that the reader would love to read them would want to go to these places where they don't want to go at all i think that puts a tremendous uh, responsibility on us to even bring joy and light and humor which is there but even we as writers sometimes don't want to see it even we are blinded by our own uh, sometimes you know our preconceptions so i remember when i began writing people would say oh you should make this it does doesn't it stink doesn't it stink but when i would ask the waste people they never said they never told me it stank because they were used to it they would always tell me about how they found makeup they found ice cream you know on a hot day we found ice cream and we ate ice cream and it was so amazing so they it, it's also a place where a child grows up and there is a place of joy and humor and romance and birthday parties and we, even we as writers have to take away our um, that wheel of preconception that we have as readers we have to take away that wheel of preconception that we have and go to places and listen to stories and consume stories and also tell them in more engaging ways i think it puts a tremendous responsibility on writers to tell stories in engaging ways thank you um so i'm sorry to to jump in there's uh, someone in the chat who has beat me to the question i was going to ask and sanjoy the questions actually to you and i know you've responded in the chat but if we were to move it to the panel um when we talk about storytelling we also have to acknowledge who is telling the story and whose stories are being told um today uh today in where we are in india um sanjoy whose whose voices do you think are not being represented enough um what who should we be what do we need to do to create a platform for different kinds of people to come in and tell their tell their own stories um and how how can we make that happen the world is has never been a place of great equity or indeed empathy so if you look back into history whether uh, it's been the great crusades and even before it's always about been land grab in the name of religion or whatever but if you look at the world today uh, the phone or the or the or the mobile and social media has actually democratized the way people can that get their voice heard yes much of much of today is now taken over by the hatred as opposed to what somia said the love and the beauty that stories hold dear and i think therein you need a movement um earlier for example if you look at india and if you just look at english uh, uh, publications uh, 15 years ago if arundhati roy sold 5000 copies should be on the best seller list today that would be 50000 uh, copies to or 35 to 50000 copies to be on the best seller list but more importantly if you look at the language uh, traditions and the rich dialect and language traditions we have in india you will have a uh, hundreds of platforms where writers new and old are coming together to be able to tell their stories and more importantly whether you love tiktok or facebook or twitter or whatever these are places that stories are being told every day facebook is full of stories yes there's hatred as well but i think there's a responsibility for each one of us to be able to ensure that the push back against hatred is through knowledge and understanding empathy is the only one thing that can bring us together how do you bring about empathy by being able to tell people that there is a, re a reality that's different from your and my reality we may consider our reality in this bubble today 
but there are different realities of those people who don't have the access that we have. It is to them that we owe the storytelling of great perseverance, of great uh, integrity, of dharma, of duty, of responsibility. It is for these people that the age old stories, which are sort of rekindled in so many different forms, whether it's through on the OTT platforms or through the um, Mahabharats that you see on Doodarshan, et cetera. It's these traditional stories that are retold again and again and again and reinterpreted by all kinds of communities, whether it's the LGBTQ or the main genders, et cetera. Where there is an issue, even today, is the divide that we are seeing, which digital media is producing, those who have access to digital media and those who don't. And in that, like as always, we're seeing that those who are bottom of the food chain of the ecosystem, those who are seen to be within the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe uh, 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 segments, their stories you're not hearing all the time. You are hearing the Hathrases of the world. You are hearing their stories because primarily because of social media. Otherwise, these atrocities too would continue to be played out as they are every minute of the day across the length and breadth, not just of India, but across the world. But you're finding Black Lives Matter came about, why? Because of one incident which came to the fore because it was a story that and a narrative that grabbed the attention of everybody. So there is a change, lots to be done. We have to ensure that we are able to integrate. Otherwise, collectively society or societies across the world will suffer. You cannot continue to subjugate in the way that people have been subjugated. It's impossible. Their stories must be brought out, must be heard. And going back to what Arun and Soumya said, it is a time to listen. <laughs> Oh, me, uh, Please, Mia, of course. Uh, yeah. Time to listen. And uh, Sanjay mentioned uh, the need for empathy. And he mentioned also integration. Um, social media is a great place to allow people to tell more stories. And there's so many stories being told on social media. And every story can be told with another perspective. And so you take the same facts as it were and um, it's reported through your lens. So the same incident uh, is interpreted. That's what history is all about. I mean, history is written in, through different lenses. So I'm just going to say, we talk about nationalism. I am uh, WhatsApp groups are forming because they're easy for people who were in class with me in the 1950s in a boarding school up in the Himalayas, who are still surviving, we are all in our late 70s. Uh, to connect together. And they're concerned about Kashmir. They are on opposite sides of what has gone wrong there and what should be done there. And they, we, all of us went to the same school and taught the same ways then. But here we are. And then they are talking about uh, the various things happening in our country, Hindutva and not. And you can see how we are already divided in the way we are seeing the facts. But fortunately, the people who are on this, the eight or nine who are still surviving and talking uh, together, have been reading a lot of history since then. And many of them are, um, have been generals, they're Sikhs, and generals of our army, lieutenant generals. And so they are Sikhs, and so they have read a lot of Sikh history. And the Sikh history intersects with Indian history and, of course, Kashmir history. And uh, some of them are from the southern parts of India, and they have read more from the Brahmanical and Maharashtrian perspective, the histories, and therefore Kashmiri Pandits. And they've read the histories also, but different histories about the same situations. And the disagreements amongst these people today who are reading stories, but reading stories which have been written from different perspectives. And on social media, this is therefore horrible. For one thing, you to get attention must make it a 30 second something or a 144 a character tweet, and uh, you can't say much in that, and you better say it sharply to be noticed, yes? And other people will also say whatever they have to say, which is the opposite, sharply to be noticed. So there's more talking because of social media 
and much less listening, and especially less listening to people who don't think like you. And this is what is destroying the world. So it's the form of the conversation, not so much the technology that enables people to connect. And Sanjoy mentioned about the one year listening to each other. We were able to listen to uh, street children from Salang Balak Trust. They weren't speaking the same language as the could not, as the economists there, but they spoke by making a play about why they left, where they left and their lives on the street. So they were telling a story in a different medium. So the medium is very important also. And I'm afraid the social medium, the social technology medium is destroying empathy in the world, is destroying people listening to each other and understanding that we have all different histories. And our histories have been told to us also, not completely because they were written generally from the perspective of rulers and the perspective of big battles, even the, the Mahabharata. But what about the stories of the peasants of India through these last three, 4,000 years? I mean, how did they feel about the Brahmins or they feel about the Muslims and their lives? <laughs> and to the, your thing about the mountains, Soumya, I mean, these people, I mean, what does it really matter to them? Uh, who ruling? It hasn't changed their lives over centuries. And even today, it doesn't matter which government comes, pro-Hindutva or anti-Hindutva, the lives of these people are hardly changing. So this is the essence that we brought about in the work that Sanjay uh, mentioned. And I found during the pandemic that many of these conversations were being reprised because our concerns for the basic things were coming out. And our feeling that we had been getting it wrong all this time, though we were celebrating our great progress. So I wrote, put together very quickly, a book called The Billion Fireflies, the same image of small people rising with their own light because they care for things around themselves, not too much, but that's all they can do. But they're all improving their lives along with lives of few other people around themselves. And this model of change, fireflies are rising, is the model by which India will be a great country, not by having big leaders on the top and giving big programs, uh, which we've done from Nehru's time and onwards. India will not become good for the common people of, of, of India. And this book, this is coming to the power of technology. You see, producing a book in the regular old way takes, after you've written it, another eight or nine months or something like that, because there's a whole uh, process there. I, when I said, look, the pandemic is sort of finishing, we thought the first <laughs> time, or a, and people better remember that suddenly they're saying, ah, let's go back to normal. Let's you know, get out and start traveling once again and going back and having the same old conversations and meetings. Let's remember what we said we would not do. So quickly, I put this book together, reprising the conversation that I had heard during that time. And it was published within three days of my writing it. And it was available in New York and the USA, a hard copy two or three days after that. This was not possible in the present publishing world where I write a book, it's available in India and you can't get it somewhere else and so on. Technology has made possible the telling of stories and making them accessible elsewhere. So that's good about technology, but I'm saying otherwise, social media, the format of it is awful. We need to learn to say things in a few words, but not in the form of a tweet, but in the form of a haiku poem. It's beautiful, it's 17 syllables, but it gets an idea and makes you listen to yourself and listen to nature around yourself. So that's the art of writing that I wish to discover. Thank you. Um, I, must, I must address the social media thing uh, because I, Sajwa, I see where you are coming from. So many movements have been possible because of social media. So many people now have access to platforms that they didn't. But Mr. Myra, to your point, uh, I think the point we are at with social media right now is that very often it replicates power structures that we see in the outside world are being replicated online. And therefore, there are limitations to what it can do. And at the end of the day, the algorithm is being made by someone sitting probably in Silicon Valley who has no concept uh, or care to make an equal, like an equalizing platform uh, and it's meant for something else. So. Yes, uh, technology does have its limitations. And uh, Ms. Amari, you did already venture a little bit into what I was going to ask you next, which was how do we use stories? How do we use narratives uh, for social change? Uh, and when you were talking about a billion fireflies, you talked about people needing 
to create their change themselves um, with like and like harnessing their own their own power, their own energy, their own light. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that before we move on to another question? No, I just would say it is stories. I say the poem is a story. Mm -hmm. The tweet is not a story. The tweet is a comment or it's a criticism. It's not a story. So whatever you write, it should be a narrative because narratives and stories are able to connect complicated things and make it seem that it's natural it should be this way. And this is what we've lost. We're getting too much into economics and science where you got a lot of data about everything and knowledge about nothing, actually. So even write books of economics as stories. And I've learned a lot about uh, what's happening in uh, the global economy through, I'm going to name some of the books, The Travels of a T-Shirt in the Global Economy. Yes, it's the story of a T-Shirt traveling through the global economy, written by some eminent economists, young economists, women economists in the US, explaining why people are exploited while other people are you know, celebrating the fact that they can get the latest fashions in a few days time somewhere else. And India wishing to join those global supply chains and what will happen to our workers. It's, it's inevitable in the structures of, of the economy. The empire of cotton, a much longer story, again, told as a story about what you mentioned earlier about power and how power is used to take over lands, take over crops, take over labor, make them slaves to cultivate cotton on other lands which you've taken in North America. It is about power that is used um, and uh, making everything in the earth, including human beings as resources for an economy, but told as, as, a, as a terrific story with all the facts and numbers as required to embellish here and there in the story. The story which uh, Mahmoud Mandani tells, uh, Mira Naya's husband, uh, um, well, he's famous in himself, uh, neither settler nor native. It's a terrifically told story. But I'm saying, going down to the depth of these stories, they're like histories, but told from another perspective. They're not mm -hmm. histories written in terms of kings and events and battles from the perspective of the, which are usually told from the perspective of Columbus who arrived and now right. in the yeah. United States is saying, no, no, let's say it's indigenous days, people's days, not Columbus's days. But that's how we celebrate in terms of the, the people on the top. And so, yes, it must be told as a story because it makes sense and a story then appeals to certain people. And the perspective from which you tell the story will enable those who others who otherwise have not even heard their own story to feel empowered, you see? So telling stories about poor people in language that poor people themselves can absorb and get pride in their story. Pride in their story helps them to feel proud of who they were, even though other histories have said, you are the scheduled castes and you don't matter. So write, write whatever you write, write it as a good story. Can I just add? Uh, Please do. Yeah. This issue of social media, I feel that what stories do is that they take you from this, they lift you from this space of chatter to a space of feeling, a space of empathy. They like there may be a lot of chatter on Twitter, but what stories do is they take you away from the chatter and take you to a place of feeling, a place of empathy. Even a waste picker is a person, a Muslim is a person. It's not just somebody clashing with you on Twitter. That person is a person. A woman is a person. And the ability of stories is to infuse you with emotion, in, infuse you with possibility, and infuse you with a sense that yes, this is a person I can feel for. Uh, and like Sanjay began by saying that today is Ashtami. And I think for so many um, women and or everyone, I think there's hardly any more empowering story than say to the Durga Satishati. You really feel so empowered and it's something so modern and so empowering. And that, that tremendous story of uh, conquering good over evil, I think hardly anyone who reads it will not be feel, um, you know, empowered by it and how they place the goddess over I mean, it's 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 a pretty 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 empowering. Um, they placed her right on top of the pantheon of all the gods and goddesses and everybody, and it gives you a tremendous sense as a woman or as anybody that that sense of possibility, that sense of crossing boundaries, even if it is just in this case of that page, and you may return back to your life, but there is that sense of possibility. So I think what stories do, as opposed to social media, is that they infuse you, they take you to a space of feeling, they take you to a space of empathy. They make people, people, people who you think are not that that society tells us are not people. Stories tell us that they are people, 
right? Like if you've read Sujata Girla's book, um, uh, the name is just slipping out of my mind. It makes Dalits into people because it's showing you what are they eating? What are they not able to eat? What are they aspiring? They also aspire for something. And let me tell you, if we don't tell those stories, the, then the power of social media is that if we fail in our duty to tell those stories, they will tell those stories because injustice survives in darkness. The further we keep that darkness, the, the, the more that injustice grows, right? And so if we don't, if we fail to tell those stories, they will tell, they, they will, um, you know, they will, they will have to take that and they will tell their own stories. And I would definitely say that it takes you to a place of feeling, it takes you to a place of empathy, and it makes people who are not like yourself people. Thanks. Um, thank you, Swami. I'm going to switch really quickly because I think uh, it has come up a couple of times in this conversation today, um, and it's a question that we received in the chat earlier on. Um, the stories we hear are very much informed by the world that we exist in. So who do we have access to? Who are we listening to? How were we raised? What were we told? Um, and while we have talked very much about the power of narratives, um, how, what do you how do you address narratives when they have created the norms that we are used to today and those need to change? So how do you retell or change the stories or your understanding of these stories to, to bring about change um, in the society that you are in? Uh, I, I'll, I'll leave this as an open question. Anybody who would like to take it, please do. And we've oh. got to write our own story. You know, going yeah. back to the old stories and trying to rewrite them from other perspective, this is why we've got a problem. We are trying to rewrite history from different perspectives. That's the past. What is the story we want to write now? And that starts, must start, and Sanjay will uh, confirm this uh, because this is what we've experienced, is ask everyone, what do you really care about most of all? I don't want to ask you what is wrong in the world. I don't want to ask you the solution to the world. Just tell me what you care about most deeply. And let everyone, uh, Dalit boy or a a rich woman, just shut their eyes and say, what do you care about most deeply in the world? And then I like to ask them that if the world were to be a better place, who other than yourself, whose life would you see who would want it to be really improved? And so going to Ananta De Gandhiji's thing, imagine the person who you feel presently is the most uh, deprived of uh, well-being in the world. And how would you like to see their lives change? And when all people speak like this, it's so interesting. They care for the same basic things. <laughs> I mean, they express them in, in, the, in the stories of other people, different sorts, but same basic things. This enables us to unite. And then we say, okay, if we had to write a story, our story going forward, what would that story be? So this is the scenario that uh, Sanjay was referring to. Let's write our story now. And in writing the story forward, we will realize the power question that you mentioned, that we would be expecting the brightest amongst us to write this vision and this story. No, we are going to get the people who so far have been listened to, not listened to, they will write the story. So the scenarios in those four pictures, the pictures were produced by a young woman uh, who was actually just listening all this time. And we were then trying to write the policies or the stories that were coming out of all that extensive work, she says, this won't make sense to any of us. So we said, what would you do? So she said, can I offer you four pictures? And the pictures, as he said, the pictures tell a very complex story very beautifully. So let the people write the story in their words. And more and more, therefore, we want to hear as you said, the uh, waste pickers writing their stories. And you as a great writer would write it in their voice. And we need to hear that. But empower them, like you said, Soumya, let them write the story actually, <laughs> because they'll say it with even more understanding and uh, 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 well, with anger maybe, but that's okay. We need to hear that anger. We need to hear that anger. So I would say that please don't ask me, a fellow who's done very well in life, to uh, write stories which will explain the world. Uh, I'm listening and learning, but let's encourage in, in different ways. On social media also, it need not be uh, everything in a tweet, but can we, and this is where Sanjay is playing a seminal role in the world today from my mind, 
He's allowing lots of different types of stories being told. And I know in the Jaipur Literature Festival, he runs into trouble all the time with powers that be, that this story you can't allow to be told. This author cannot come here. But those are the ones we really need to hear. Yeah. Um, Sandra, you also look like you were about to say something. Um... Exactly what Arun said. I was saying when you walk into a bookstore and you choose if you like um, books on food, you'll drift there. If you like poetry, you'll drift to the poetry shelf and bookstores therefore you know lay themselves out like that in the same way that if you switch on your television to watch news and if you are used to watching republic tv if it still yeah. seems to be a news channel or, or times now or, or some such then well that's the way you will that's the kind of stories you wish as opposed to say so the responsibility is what arun is talking about the responsibility of publishers, of curators, of programmers, of, of bookstores is to inform an audience. And one of the things we've noticed at the Jaipur Literature Festival where we try to uh, provide a platform for all kinds, not necessarily uh, the politics that I would subscribe to or Namita or William would subscribe to personally, but all kinds. And in there, what is surprising is when people come in there and they stumble upon a writer. And in that stumbling upon a writer, their mind is, is opened or the doors to their mind to another world is opened up. Who would have known Michael Sandel was Michael Sandel till they stumbled upon Michael Sandel at the Jaipur Literature Festival and he blew you away. Similarly, a Rupi Kaur, for example, for you know people like us who tend to be skeptical about uh, you know about young poets because how do you how how do you become a young poet? I mean you know what the the process of writing. When you listen to a Rupi Kaur, you can see the evolution from young to uh, to mature, and it addresses a particular kind of story. So we have to provide uh, the space, the opportunity, and the possibility of a million stories or a billion stories that Arun was talking about. And those collectively, as they, as they rise into the night sky, they illuminate us with knowledge and information. But again, it's a choice. Finally, you can take that donkey to the water, but can you get the donkey to drink? You can provide many books, but will you get them to read and understand and listen, et cetera? You know, finally, we have to create a society that allows of, of, for people to be able to examine, understand, listen, assimilate, and empathize. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sanjoy. And I, I know we're all, we're, we are over time. I've been told we have another minute at the most. So, uh, Soumya, when you, uh, as an activist, as a journalist, if we're looking at passing the mic, if we're looking at people telling their own stories, if we're looking at... Um, if we're looking at just expanding how what people have access to, and therefore, I mean, choice, like Sandra said, the choice is theirs. Um, what what do you think? Um, what are some of the things that we can do to make that more possible? And I think we'll we'll wrap with that question. To, make, to begin to begin reading different kinds of stories. To to create more access to different kinds of stories, and or to create or to create to begin reading different kinds of stories. I let you pick which which version of this you'd like to answer. I do feel that there are a lot of stories. There are a lot of stories out there, and I think as readers, it's who who we pick and who we read. I think we need to be more intentional and really push our uh, limits in terms of who we read as, as Sanjay said you always go in and you look at the same sections that you've looked at look at the same stories and also social media serves the purpose of creating an echo chamber and you live in that echo chamber or television news for example creates an echo chamber and you live in your own echo chamber in fact I think it was Svetlana Alexovich who said that facts don't change anybody's mind it's it's stories that change people's minds. And so it's important to tell those stories. And you know, earlier you were asking me that how, uh, how is activism and you know, journalism and that kind of thing. And I would say that sometimes in our country, like um, that, that, that it's so important to tell individual stories because it's so easy for these stories that may seem individual to be subsumed in large stories, to be subsumed in large narratives. 
there's so many different strands in our country of stories um, that, that, that it is very easy for us to say, oh, but so and so is doing, like, like Mr. Myra said, oh, but the GDP is growing, like I've covered the stock market. And I know at one point that was shown as an example of shining India, that, stock, that the stock market is growing. But if you see participation in the stock market, it's like barely a decimal point of all Indians participating in the stock market. Or corporate India represents a small decimal fraction of the real Indian economy. And so what we think is the major narrative and what we think is a small narrative are not are sort of often flawed perceptions. And therefore it's important for us to look at those individual stories that we think are maybe just individual stories, but sometimes they run that danger of being subsumed in a larger narrative that, that maybe big media is telling us is, a la is, is, the, is the dominant narrative or the real narrative, but it may not necessarily be the real um, a representative narrative of what is going on in the, in the economy, in our country, in our society. And in fact, it's very important for us to be seeing those things that are seething, that are bubbling, but that we are invisible to. Those individual stories that we think are individual, but actually they're telling you the pain of a generation, of many generations, of centuries. Like in Marathi, we have a whole pantheon of Dalit literature, of women writing as Dalits, of Dalits writing as Dalits, right? And there are the most beautiful stories, for example, of what they did um, when they, suppose they're walking on the street and they find a dead cow or dead cattle. It would it was a source of great celebration for them. How they... they elongated the life of that, that, that whatever cow or uh, buffalo that they found for more than a month by eating it in different ways of pickling it and curing it and eating it. And for them, so it's important for us, like those of us who may think of it as anathema, to be doing such a thing. And yet for them, it was the only way for them to survive, to live. And it's important for us to um, you know, realize that there are different narratives and they should not get subsumed within what we are told as a narrative. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Omeya. And I see that uh, Sudhanshu has already began thanking participants for joining us today. We are over time. Um, so I think on that note, uh, to for all three of you, thank you so much for, for joining me on this panel and to everybody who tuned in. Thanks for taking the time. Um, I hope the rest of Sankalp is as enjoyable as I know this conversation was today. Um, but thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Karachi. Enjoy. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, lovely. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye, everybody. Happy Ashtami. To you too. Bye. To you too. Bye, Samia.